That's better. Thank you very much. Um, so, good afternoon and welcome to this session. Uh, it's the third offshore wind session today, looking specifically at the offshore wind trajectory. Um, I think the meaning of that will become clear. But really what we're talking about is the trajectory in terms of cost, the trajectory in terms of policy, uh, and the trajectory in terms of what markets are emerging. And, and you'll hear about all of those subjects from, from the panelists and, and from myself. Um, usual housekeeping issues, there's no planned fire alarms. So if you do hear the alarm, follow the green signs. Uh, mobiles to silent, please, um, if you don't mind. Um, and we have had one late cancellation from the program, uh, from the panel, which leaves plenty of time for our speakers to fully explore their subject matter and for you to ask questions of us um, and potentially to get to the cocktails quickly. So, um, so without further ado, I shall uh, introduce the panel. Um, first of all, my name is Neil Douglas. I'm the director of BVG Associates. Uh, I've been involved in renewables industry for something north of 20 years. Um, to my immediate right is Christian Petrick uh, of IEA RTD. Um, he's a freelancer based in Barcelona and his expertise is in the area of renewable energy policy. Uh, to Christian's right is Ines Tunga. Uh, Ines is a research engineer with the ETI based in Loughborough. Um, and last but not least, at the far end of the table, is Andy Oldroyd. Andy is the proprietor of Oldbound Services, been in the industry for around 15 years and with specialism very much in offshore wind, wind measurement, remote sensing, and increasingly in new markets. Um, so we will be uh, covering various aspects, as I mentioned, with regards to cost, with regards to policy, and with regards to new markets, but very much looking at what the future holds. Slightly unusually uh, for the program as chair, I've been asked to give a short presentation as well. So I've introduced myself. I will now go up to the podium and do that. OK. So. Here we go. Oh gosh, this video as well. I wasn't expecting that. Um, so yeah, Neil Douglas, uh, director of BVG. Um, if you don't know who BVG are, uh, we're a business that's been established for over 10 years now. We focus in three main areas, uh, business advisory services to the renewables industry and those seeking to enter the renewables industry. Um, project and technology economics, so perhaps what we're best known, known for is levelised cost of energy studies uh, for the industry from both a technology, componentry and project point of view. Um, and last but not least, uh, technology services that we provide, engineering services for projects, investment due diligence, strategy and R&D support. <clears throat> so, quick overview of what I'd like to talk to you about, and this is really with regards to the cost trajectory for, for offshore wind. Quick look <laughs> at recent offshore wind auction results. What is driving the downward trajectory that we're seeing in levelised cost of energy for offshore wind? There's quite a variation between a lot of these auction results ac across Europe. and. Seeking to understand those differences is very important, and particularly as we focus a little bit closer to home, what these auction results mean for the UK offshore industry. So without further ado, we'll jump straight in to some data. So just to explain the, the setup of this slide, first of all, we've got levelised cost of energy in euros per megawatt hour on the uh, y-axis, along the x-axis, we've got the projected year of commercial operation of these projects. And plotted on the graph, we have the uh, inferred levelised cost of energy from various auction results across Europe. Um, the point there being that an auction result does not necessarily represent a base levelised cost of energy, an auction result, an auction bid obviously includes 
some margin and some other external costs that are added on. So we've made an attempt to levelise all of these down to, or normalise these, I should say, down to the LCOE. We have the blue wash was the uh, industry's best prediction in sort of third quarter of 2015 as to the trajectory for offshore wind LCOE. The grey wash is a, the latest projections for LCOE for offshore wind. And the black line is the projected cost of, uh, from the Bayes report from last November for combined cycle gas LCOE. So that's the setup, and just to draw your attention to, to the dots that are on here and to show the trajectory. So October 2015, we had the results of the first CFD round, uh, two projects which came in, roughly speaking, uh, 120 pounds per megawatt hour, something in the order of 130, 140 euros per megawatt hour. So those were the first, those were East Anglia and, and NNG and Scottish waters. Um, and those were, broadly speaking, seen to be within the range of expectations for, for LCOE, for offshore wind projects in the UK. In the following sort of 12 to 18 months after that, there were a number of auction results that caused people to really sit up and take notice. Principally, the Danish auctions, which are the blue dots around here, and these two triangles, the red and the orange triangles, which was the uh, Borsella projects one through to four in Dutch waters, which appeared to be an order of magnitude below what had been achieved in the CFD round one in, in the UK. And one of the things I'll come on to talk about is understanding the differences between these auction systems, because one, the, one of the implications of these auction results is, is the impression it gives to government to the impression that it gives to policymakers and the impression that it gives to society as a whole, if you like, in terms of what costs should be expected. Uh, so one of, one of the messages I'm keen to get across is it's very important to hold these, uh, the, the, the particular characteristics of these auctions in mind before jumping to conclusions. And that's particularly true when we look at some of the more recent results that have come out. So just in the last couple of weeks, we've had the Dong Cluster One project in German waters, which was widely headlined as being subsidy free, given that the bid that they put into that auction was zero euros per megawatt hour, not seeking any, any subsidy from that auction whatsoever. That's not to say, of course, that it's a zero LCOE, there is clearly a cost to that energy, but what it was seeking from the market was zero. So if you were a policymaker, you might look at that and say, why am, I, why am I paying this? Why can't I get this? Well, we have to understand the differences, both in terms of the structure of the auction, the particular market that that applies to, and, and the characteristics of the site. And we'll come on to talk about that. So what can we expect now in, in the UK? So stick our necks out a little bit here. Where do we think the CFD round that's coming up is going to land? Uh, this is a project, these are projects that would be going live in 2021. We think that's going to be somewhere around or perhaps south of 100 euros per megawatt hour, 85 pounds per megawatt hour. We're not the only people saying that, not sticking our necks out too much. So it's showing a reasonable trajectory from the first UK projects. Um, it's well within the, the grey band, which is the, the, the latest sort of industry task force type projections. And it's also interestingly starting getting down towards the combined cycle gas LCUE projections from the Bayes report. So the question is at what point does this trajectory touch that trajectory? which means that offshore wind would be competing, which is what, what is generally expect, uh, accepted to be the cheapest form of new generation on, on the wires. Okay. So, a little bit of a focus then on what is driving these reductions in LCOE, regardless of the differences between the different auctions. I was speaking in a, a, an onshore session this morning, and to anybody that was at that, 
Uh, you may have recognized some of the slides that I've used so far, and if so, please explain them to your neighbor. Um, but we're also focused in that section on onshore. And it's, it's almost an entirely separate set of drivers that are, that, that are being considered with regards to, to onshore. But with offshore, we're talking about very large pipelines of projects. We're talking about very large sites. We're talking about very big players pulling very big levers, being able to pull very big levers in terms of addressing costs. Um, we're also looking at projects that are some years in the future. So for example, this German zero subsidy bid uh, is a project that is uh, you know, six or eight years away, six, seven years away in terms of when it would actually go live. So there's, there's a number of assumptions being made about what will be the available and optimal size of turbine at that point. Whereas with the, the UK bids, they're a lot closer in terms of the time horizon, therefore, you're not able to confidently make such aggressive assumptions about the size of the turbines that will be available. We're also talking, as I mentioned, about very large players that have got access to low-weighted average cost of capital. We're also dealing with a technology that is rapidly able to demonstrate that the technical risks that may have been a concern within the, the, the banking sector five or ten years ago are, are no longer such a, high, uh, such a high risk. The technology is shown to be mature, reliable, stable, um, as is evidenced by the fact that a lot of projects are selling on equity stakes into the uh, uh, infrastructure fund type market, pension fund market, sovereign wealth markets, all of which only make investments in relatively low risk, stable technologies that yield a single digit return over the long term. So offshore wind has reached that point that it can, that it can access cheaper capital. We're also seeing some level of convergence in technology and foundation uh, with regards to things like foundations and cabling. Um, and we're definitely seeing a response from the full supply chain in terms of understanding that it is working in a competitive auction-based system. Uh, compare that to its, the, the predecessor to the CFD in the UK, of course, the renewables obligation, which didn't necessarily drive the right behaviours in terms of of reducing costs. We're also dealing with partially de-risked auctions, particularly in the case of, of some of the, the European auctions, which I'll come on to talk about a little bit more. And we're also seeing the, the, those people that are successful in winning these auctions backing themselves in terms of continuing their learning curves, continuing to leverage the experience that they have, um, and therefore assuming that what they do in 2024 will be a lot better than what they're doing in 2016, in 2016 or 2017. So there's a lot of assumptions that are, that are being, that are being modelled in. So I said that I would try and summarise some of the differences between, broadly speaking, the continental Europe auctions and, and the UK CFD. Um, and the key point here, and I don't wish to be a forebringer of doom, but I, we should not perhaps expect all of those LCOE advantages that we're seeing, uh, taking advantage of in the European auctions to, to translate to the UK. First of all, in many of these uh, continental European auctions, the bidders are bidding for the same project. So everybody looking at a, the same piece of seabed and the same site characteristics. So the, 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 they really are competing purely on their cost and their ability to do it cheaply rather than there being a competition between the characteristics of the site. In the UK auction, it's one developer's site against another developer's site. There's no commonality there. We're also seeing projects that are either wholly or at least partly pre-consented, or the, the risks of the consenting process are significantly reduced. So there's no pricing for that risk. Um, and a lot of the costs have already been, been sunk in that regard. I, apologies for the little typo in there. Um, we were also seeing some of the very significant project costs being externalized, particularly things like grid. Um, we're also seeing a defined pipeline of projects. There's good certainty in terms of what volume is coming to market and when. Therefore, 
those large players are able to take a long-term view um, and uh, price accordingly. And there's a certain degree of flexibility in build-out, and they're able to make those assumptions that I've mentioned about learning, about experience, and about the size of the turbines that will be coming along. Whereas in the UK market, we're seeing bidders competing on different sites. We're seeing those project developers taking all of the development risk. And of course, to bid for a CFD, you have to be significantly down the road of, of having consent, or, or you need to have secured your consent. So a multi-million, if not tens of million pounds investment is required even to get to that point, all of which is at risk, all of which therefore has to be priced. We're also seeing transmission costs, largely internalized. Um, and whilst there might be an assumed pipeline of projects, there is a, a fair degree of uncertainty about when the auctions will be happening. Therefore, what's the timing? How, how am I going to get my whole pipeline away? Um, and very specific requirements in terms of build out once an auction is won. Therefore, that puts pressure on the developers to be relatively conservative about the turbine choices and bearing in mind that turbine choice and turbine size is one of the very biggest levers that you can pull in terms of reducing your LCOE. So that's the skip over the top that I, I had promised with regards to the trajectory for LCOE. Um, there'll be ample time for questions towards the end, but I'll now be uh, handing over to the rest of the panel. So if you give me two seconds. So, yes, now we have uh, Christian from IEA, RETD, um, and he's going to talk to us specifically about the different policy frameworks for offshore wind. Yeah, thank you very much, Neil, and thank you very much for giving already a good introduction to, to what I will be presenting. Um, thank you for joining and for hanging in here until we, uh, this, uh, until the, in this last session. So, I am... I will be talking about uh, policies, uh, offshore wind policies. Um, I work for the uh, IEA RETD, which is a so-called technology collaboration program of, uh, within the framework of the International Energy Agency. But uh, it's important to note that I'm not talking on behalf of the International Energy Agency. Uh, and TCP uh, is like RETD, Renewable Energy Technology Deployment, is working by itself, so to speak. Um, we have uh, eight members and we commission studies in the field of renewable energy technology policies. Uh, unfortunately, this RTD will end to exist uh, in the next months, so this is one of the last studies and reports that we are doing, but please look at our website and download all the nice reports that we have done over the last 10 years. Um, <clears throat> so this study that I'm presenting um, is, has actually three uh, sections. One is on policies and regulation, another one on industry structures, and this third one on project risk management. Uh, I will focus only on the policy part, uh, but please feel free to look into the report and look, find also um, in this very comprehensive study uh, this comparison of uh, industry structures and risk management across different countries. So for policy, the, the main target audience is policy makers, but also industry stakeholders, uh, and I think you will find a lot of uh, information there. Um, so the question uh, which was put forward and which was delivered to by uh, the Carbon Trust, uh, McDonald and Green Giraffe, was which policy and regulatory frameworks have been most effective in catalyzing growth, and um, <coughs> how can policymakers balance the risk profile of developers and, and government, or in the end, the consumer uh, who has to bear the costs, uh, or the taxpayer. Um, we have seen these slides uh, more or less before, uh, this, uh, just a little bit uh, yeah, similar numbers as we have seen in the other sessions. The strong growth, uh, which is projected over the next years, up to 2020, uh, we expect uh, basically a, a tripling of the, um, of the offshore uh, capacity that was deployed in 2015. Uh, most of that is in Europe, but you see also, oh, you took away my, uh, sorry, you took, oh, Neil, you have the, no, you have laser.
Uh, you also see China coming in very strongly uh, in the next years, the, the, this yellow bar. Um, and UK is down here, the, the blue bars, uh, still with an impressive um, uh, pipeline. Uh, growth beyond 2020 highly depends on policy support, and I will come to that as well. Uh, we have seen this slide uh, showing just a little bit different to what Neil showed. Um, but what you can see here, what he also said, uh, the, the strong cost reduction in the last uh, bits. Uh, and here we already included uh, the additional costs uh, that are taken over by the governments at the moment. Um, so uh, this is one of the big differences between the, these auction types between uh, UK and uh, Germany, for example, and I will show uh, some more details on that as well. Um, uh, we have to note, and we will hear about that later, the, these costs are expected to be higher in emerging markets, uh, and I think we will hear later um, what, what will happen there in Taiwan and then in China, probably. So again, this sharp decrease came uh, with the competitive auctions. So now, what are the, the policy um, pillars, or what are the most important points for policymakers? Uh, which drove this development and which will drive development further. Uh, so we uh, identified six key pillars, uh, market scale and visibility, then site development, grid connection and incentive mechanisms, and underlying supply chain development and innovation support. Uh, especially these three uh, lead to the two main emerging policy trends, which is competitive auctions that we have seen in the last years, <coughs> and the centralized development model, which was already more or less mentioned by, by Neil, and I will show now in the next slides how this looks like. So I go through these pillars um, one by one, one slide more or less each. Um, so market scale and visibility is uh, a key uh, policy ingredient that is required by most of, all, basically all the project developers. If uh, there are no targets, if these targets are not supported by concrete uh, policies, um, then the industry will just not have the confidence to, to build up. Um, we have seen very high targets in the past for the different countries in Europe, over 40 gigawatt to be deployed by 2020. Uh, this won't happen. Uh, mo every country basically has been scaling back the targets because they were not sufficient um, uh, support policies in place uh, in the last years and only on the, yeah, from 2010 to 14 basically and only in the last years industry has improved but also um, incentives have improved. Um, uh, there are possibilities if there's no long-term target uh, to hedge uh, with uh, rather short-term targets uh, which uh, what the Netherlands are doing they have a roadmap um, where they install, <coughs> plan to install 700 megawatt per year. And this helps developers to give sufficient confidence to say, okay, there, there will be a deployment, even if we don't know what the target of 2025 will be. Then <clears throat> the second point, uh, site development. Um, this is now explaining uh, what, what Neil showed in his table also, uh, the different responsibilities over the entire development cycle. So this starts with zone identification, uh, site, um, site selection, site investigation, consenting, grid application, and grid design. And here you have the countries and the schemes. So the green one, uh, the green color shows where the government or the TSO is responsible for, and the, this yellow, what uh, the de developers are responsible for. And you see this big difference uh, in the UK to the new German scheme or to even to the Dutch scheme where the developer is uh, largely dependent on most of the development of the site and uh, of the project. Uh, and only the Crown Estate is only giving the, uh, identifies the, the zones. Um, in, in Netherlands and uh, in, in Denmark, it's uh, basically everything is pre-done by the government or the TSO, uh, which means that the government has a higher risk if no one wants build there in the end, but that basically you know, doesn't happen. Um, 
and they don't have so much risk in the, in the case of the UK and uh, for the developer it's the way around so there's a higher risk for developing uh, projects in in the UK than uh, in the other um, uh, in the other countries at least with regards to the development cycle so um, some developers prefer actually having the control over this process uh, it also helps them uh, to have a larger portfolio uh, because the, the disadvantage is if you go for this model then you have just certain zones and then you bid for these zones and if you don't win uh, then you actually lost all the development costs for for this specific site um, so ideally even if the trend is going in this direction as you see the germans for example uh, changed to from this model to a, a rather um, centralized development model um, it would be actually beneficial to to keep a little bit this these difference over the different uh, in the different countries in Europe to allow uh, greater portfolios for the developers then the next one is the grid connection um, also trying to visualize uh, the different responsibilities from uh, the uh, this turbine foundations uh, array cables and then the um, offshore substation export cables offshore converter and then the export cables to the to the shore uh, there are deep charging models uh, which basically where the developer is in charge of almost everything up to the shore which happens in the US uh, and then there are shallow or super shallow models where the developer is only in charge of uh, yeah, what is happening really offshore and the rest is being done by um, by the TSO or the government or whoever and then, and then there are uh, hybrid models where the uh, li like in the UK where the developer builds uh, the export cables and uh, offshore converter station but then hands it over to the offshore uh, transmission operator um, so yeah this also shows that uh, uh, in these cases the the developer has higher costs which have to be reflected then in the in the bidding process then uh, the fourth pillar uh, are the incentive mechanisms uh, we have seen this development from capital grants over feed and tariffs or feed and premiums or the, the UK rocks now to the competitive auctions. So this is a clear trend uh, which will most likely continue. Um, in emerging markets, they may not even do this anymore. They may go either right away for feed and tariffs or competitive auctions, but they have to take and bear in mind that um, in, in Europe uh, it took some some time to get there uh, because uh, the experience in supply chain had to um, uh, get up to speed and uh, it's not something that you can if, if you start with a competitive auction right away you may also fail or you may have you may get higher prices uh, or strategic bits that uh, lead in the end to um, a non -implement implementation of the of the project. <clears throat> um, here you see the differences of the risks, how the risks have changed uh, for um, because of the competitive auction. So allocation risk is going up, price risk is going up because there's more competition in an auction, there are capaci capacity constraints, uh, the final strike price is not known. So these are risks that have been in uh, that were increasing. But development risk, funding risk, and technical risk are in general decreasing. Um, even if site conditions become more challenging, uh, new technologies are required, um, or more f uh, there is actually uh, an increasing trust by funders uh, and um, yeah, better learning by doing that um, all these risks are, are decreasing over time. Uh, with regards to the supply chain, we talked in the session before a lot about local content. Um, uh, so market sh uh, scale and visibility is, is very important uh, to, to get a good supply chain in place. Um, it helps um, decreasing the LCOE 
and to set up a local love supply chain because if they know that you were coming are coming then you can also really build uh, up your um, your enterprises local content requirements can be done uh, but they potentially have a high impact on the LCOE meaning uh, the LCOE has to be uh, will, will probably go higher because the companies are not may not be as competitive as if you really open uh, the call for everybody um, so uh, the recommendation is rather if the government wants to intervene here to go with bottom-up approach infrastructure investments uh, business innovation support and training um, where you can may or we can have an impact on the local supply chain um, but you don't have too much negative impact on the LCE and in the session before we heard the uh, operation maintenance uh, part of the project is actually where a lot of local content can be created uh, oops. Um, also, for, with regards to the supply chain, what has to be considered for, for emerging markets um, in Europe? We have, uh, we are lucky because everything is around uh, the North Sea or uh, Baltic Sea. Uh, so, um, uh, suppliers, uh, stakeholders, policymakers, everybody is uh, kind of very closely together. So, if you go uh, to China to new markets in the U.S., um, this doesn't exist yet uh, and still needs to be built up. Um, and the sixth pillar, oops, uh, the sixth pillar is innovation support, um, uh, where over the entire development cycle, uh, basic R&D, applied R&D demonstration and deployment <coughs> uh, support is required um, to develop new uh, innovative technologies. For example, like now the um, floating offshore wind uh, or floating systems or the uh, new materials um, or, or, or other topics and we will hear about that in a moment then um, then we found that there are five overarching principles so we have the six pillars um, and then we see that there are some overarching principles that should be applied to almost everybody I come in two minutes I'm at the end <laughs> Uh, which is uh, stability, so uh, this long-term view, market confidence and lack of policy change. Uh, there were too many policy changes in the past. Uh, visibility, I mentioned that, uh, but then also flexibility, for example, with regards to the constant envelope so that uh, sub, um, project developers can use the most innovative technologies when they really build it and not uh, the ones that they uh, thought about when they uh, Doing, doing the bid. Coordination, especially within the government departments, uh, so that you have a one-stop shop approach. And then collaboration across the R&D uh, within different companies, uh, research institutes, and so on. So coming to the end, the conclusion is, yeah, the offshore wind is at the cusp of sharp growth and market cost, market cost reduction. Uh, we are entering a maturation phase, uh, which will be different in emerging markets, so they will have to go part, uh, partially through this uh, process still. Um, supportive policy frameworks are crucial or have been crucial uh, to drive this change and the policy trends, competitive auctions and centralized development models show that policies uh, are important. Um, uh, and um, capacity constraints auction uh, will require higher government de-risking um, and, and so some development within the governments themselves or some uh, capacity building within governments. So overall, um, it will be critical to continue policy support for offshore wind, although it's mature, uh, as we also heard before, without policy support, all renewals or basically any, any technology for power generation uh, will have trouble. Um, so continue policy support is required. Um, and uh, this will then also lead to further cost reduction and expanding into new markets. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christian. A very comprehensive look at the world of, of policy and a yeah, very clear picture, I think, that these differences in policy have very real impacts in terms of how they influence particular markets. I'm, I'm sure you're all 
formulating a range of challenging and profound questions for Kristen in the Q&A session. Um, we shall move on now to Ines Tunga. Ines, thank you very much. Right, good afternoon. My name is Ines, uh, Ines Tunga. As introduced by Neil, I'm an ID Core research engineer with the Energy Technologies Institute. And in the next 10 minutes, I'll give an overview of path I'm exploring to reduce the cost. We've talked about it already, reducing the cost of energy, the levelized cost of energy, in the range of 50 to 75 pounds per megawatt hour in the UK waters. So I'll discuss the ETI motivation to invest in the offshore wind sector. I'll then give a, explain what ID Core and how does it come into the picture. I'll then give you the overview path of the project and initial results that I have. Now, the offshore wind sector, uh, ETI uh, as so the offshore wind sector was identified as a key area for investment for, uh, by ETI because of the vast resource in the, offshore, uh, in the UK waters, as well as its contributor, because it's a large contributor to the energy mix, the energy demand. And the objective of the program is to accelerate the de development, deployment, as well as grid integration. Now on the top, does this work? On the left-hand side, we have one of the first projects, the Deepwater Project, and the project was commissioned in 2009, and the goal of the project was to deliver an economic and technical feasibility, feasibility study for a novel floating five megawatt turbine. That project led to the other project, so one of the other project is the very long blade uh, with a very long blade project, which is in excess of 100 meter. The picture shows the blade being delivered in Blythe, and that project was conducted by Blade Dynamics, and that was around in 2015. In the center there, we have a purpose-built onshore test facility, uh, so it's an offshore wind test rig that allow testing of the whole drive train before deployment. This is still an on ongoing project. And lastly, we have the, a feed study project. And the feed study project uh, was for a full-scale floating platform. On the right-hand side, we, you have the Pelastar TLP, Tension Leg Platform Project. The outcome of, of the project delivered us a design suitable for an economic deployment in most UK sites. And we mentioned about the cost quite a lot, and this project actually found that by mid to late 2020s, we can actually reach 85 pound per megawatt hour LCOE using TLPs. Now where does, what is IDCOR? IDCOR is an industrial doctoral center for offshore renewable energy. It's an engineering, engineering doctorate program based on a consortium of three universities. We have Edinburgh, Exeter, and Schwarzclyde. It's based on a four-year program, the first year being cost-based uh, in Edinburgh, and the three years after that are at a sponsoring company. I'm based in ETI, as I said earlier, and my project is specifically on offshore wind. You probably have guessed this by now. So the project is based on answering this question. Where in the UK could that cost, the range between 50 to 75 pound per megawatt hour, can be achieved using what technology, what operation, and the site? Now, to answer this question, uh, I structured the answer to this question this way. So I'm going to look at the end game is to create a model, an optimizer model that will include design variables of turbines. So I've created a data database with the turbines, turbine properties of all the current sites that we have in the UK waters. I've 
I have started working on the spatial analysis, so using a GIS tool to look at the sites, so the wind speed, the water depth, etc. That will then feed in into an optimizer tool that will specify, it's like an algorithm where it specifies the decision vector of where on that side I can get the particular cost. And with the help of an ETI cost model, I will then include the, the current data, cost data we have, so i.e. the capex and the opex, to the model to then specify the cost per region, per site as well. I hope it makes sense so far. Now, so, sorry. I borrowed this from Christian. Well, it was published, so I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is just to illustrate where we are and what are the predictions saying. And as explained over and over, we see that we, there is potential to have the cost down to 75 pounds or less, but it's quite a lot to be done. I'm not going to repeat the presentation, but that just gives you an idea of, if you look at the, prediction of where we are for 2017, we are still around 90 to above 85 to 90, so we still have a long way to be able to achieve the range. So how do we get the cost down? Now through surveys and questionnaire and uh, internal ETI project, and recent work by the cost reduction monitoring framework, it appears that a great deal of in reduce, reducing the cost has been done so far. We talked about learning by doing, we talked about scaling up the turbines, we also mentioned local content or improving supply chain, as well as what we've seen in Europe, sharing risk. So we had the sharing the transmission cost or the financial cost as well, reduction in financial costs. So where else, in terms of technology, where else can we get the cost reduction? Putting aside turbine rating and turbine upscaling, when you upscale the turbine, you also have the other component that need to follow. So the drivetrain is one of them, and combining all the optimization that's needed is the next biggest factor that will impact the cost. And how do we do that? Let's look back at the trends. You've seen that again probably quite a lot, but the graph on the left just says, as we're increasing the capacity of the turbine, so is the water depth and so is the distance to shore from shore. And it results in making the turbine more robust, making them larger, they become larger and co more complex. The right-hand side is an initial analysis of what's actually happened to the drivetrain. Now, when I'm talking about the top head at this point, I'm talking about the nacelle, it's the whole top head, so including the nacelle, the rotor, and the blade. Looking at the trend, initially we had turbines which were like induction-based, uh, induction machines, and they moved up to medium size, and now most of them are direct drive. And the reason behind it we talked about uh, is the availability, the reliability, and low maintenance. Now, how do we get this? The next couple of slides will kind of give more information about this graph. How do we get that mass down? Yes, we get the advantage from the direct drive machines, so we get the reliability, availability, and maintenance free or maintain, low maintenance, but how do we get the cost, the mass down without affecting the cost, by reducing the cost as well? I thought this would be fun. Someone to ask me earlier on, what's the whole point of the top head mass? So I thought it's four o'clock, I'm going to bore a little bit, a bit more. So let's go back to school. <laughs> we know that power is a function of the torque and rotating speed. Rotational speed, sorry. And when we start looking at the generator, you have your wind blowing, 
The wind passed through the rotor, the rotor translate that to the shaft. You have the torque. The torque affects uh, the shaft as well as the material. So it creates forces, shear stresses that need to be contained. The reason why they are contained is because you want your machine to last. Otherwise, you have to change them every five years. That defeats the purpose. So this is where we are. So you have your torque, you have your speed, and those are, these are the forces we are talking about. Now, you can't really do much about changing the speed of the wind. You can't really do much about your saturation uh, because of your air gap in the generator. So the only elements you can really play with are these ones. So you can only, the only way for you to generate more power, these are the elements that you can play with to provide more torque. So we are talking about the volume of the machine. So if you want more power, then you're looking at increasing the volume, i.e. increasing the mass. And by increasing the mass, you're increasing the cost. Increasing the cost, you're increasing everything else that's attached to your installation, et cetera. So I, I hope you get the picture. There's no quiz after this, so you can forget this now. Now, I used a qualitative assessment to understand where what are the possible factors to reduce this cost and in turn the mass? And this, I use a QFD analysis, which is a quality functional uh, analysis, deployment analysis. And that kind of gave me an idea of if a customer wants, when you have a customer through the door, they tell you what they want, and then you tell them how you're going to meet their needs. That's what he does, the, the QFD. So I looked at what does the customer want? What does the industry, the developer, anyone else want? They want a reliable machine. They want a machine that lasts long and cheap. And, this is, and the main thing is my cost. So how do I make that cost uh, as low or effective as possible? These are the main elements or factors that came into play. There's quite a lot on the slide. Feel free to go back and review it. Uh, you can also email me for more details if you want to. But that's kind of the idea of what kind of element or factors are required to make that cost down. The low mass being one of the major elements. Now, moving forward, I then compare those elements with the machine we talked about. So we talked about the induction machine, medium stage uh, defig, and the direct drive permanent magnet. How does those factors in influence the current machine. So just, just comparing the technologies with the technical requirement I'm putting forward. And we can still see that the direct drive permanent magnets are, are topping the, the elements, are, are the best machine for the job. And so I thought, looking at different data, I'm not including any data because it's a qualitative assessment. There's a lot of expert information, there's a lot of internal review, etc. So just leaving this with you, the main element that, I, that came up as the most important, uh, so we, we need a machine that is provider availability, that is available for as long as you want. So your mean time between failure being the highest. So we have reliability, redundancy measures. Then we also need to start looking at, so just to clarify, these elements I mentioned here are further analysis I'm working on to then understand from the qualitative analysis I've done, how do I then put it into number to explain what is the mass reduction, the percentage, and what is the cost reduction in turn. So by, by increasing the availability, by, by optimizing the material and components, and by optimizing the, the torque versus the active material as well. We talked about the torque in the formula, and just to have a, a picture of what, what it's all about, we see that although we are using all this, the total in purple, the only active material, i.e. the permanent magnet, or the, uh, the other steel and iron that we need, are only like a third of what we need. The rest is just to support the material to contain that those forces we talked about. So how do we optimize those machines to have as low as an optimized machine without so much inactive material? 
So in conclusion, I'll leave this uh, as final thought. So when we talk about active material, we also have our rare elements. And I don't know if you know this, but they come at cost and they're also very volatile. So how do we make the most of it? Or is there any option to look at something else, another material? So I'm looking at advanced material. I'm also looking at the impact on the load of the whole turbine, as well as floating, because we are talking about going further offshore, we are talking about going deeper in waters. So what is the impact on site selection, since that's the final goal? And just to introduce another machine, we've not talked about the high superconducting, uh, high superconducting machine. What if we start looking at them? Are they going to bring more cost reduction as well as mass? So I'll leave this point there. I know I've not answered any, but I'm hopefully I'll have a paper very soon that will give at least an overview of that. Uh, with that, I'll say thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ness. A very interesting overview of the issue of top head mass. Um, certainly, I'm aware that the, the impact of, of, of mass and weight is starting to become quite a restriction with regards to vessel development for offshore. Quite a big implication there. So, anything that addresses that, I think, is. Got a promising future. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll try and kick us off. And, and it's a question for Christian, really. Um, you, you, you alluded to sort of tension that exists between the desire for local content and, and policies that drive local content, and that sometimes being an opposing force to the levelized cost of of energy. Um, how do you see that playing out? Uh, how do you see that playing out with regards to state aid and how implications for state aid might change in the near future in the UK? I don't need to explain too much. Um, and, and what do you think is the best benefit to an econ economy? Is it, is it lowest cost of energy to the consumer or is it local content? Um, <clears throat> yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, we, we had some discussion about the long local content uh, also in the session before, I'm not sure who was there. Um, uh, we, we had seen in that session that uh, there's a lot of local content possible, um, especially uh, in the UK, maybe not so much in the uh, turbine manufacturing, or that, that would have to be built up. Um, but in uh, operation maintenance, there's actually a lot of uh, potential uh, where um, local content can be easily met uh, with, with people um, from, from the local societies. Um, personally, I think um, when you said, uh, do we only have to look at cost, but also, also the um, uh, social implications, um, I think cost should not be the only driver. Um, and this is not only my opinion for offshore wind, but for all renewables. I think renewables have a great potential uh, because of their distributed, um, you know, in general, distributed nature um, to create local jobs. Um, but that has to be also, uh, uh, there needs to be government support to, to, to help that. Um, maybe not so much with giving money, but with giving, as I said in my presentation, with the infrastructure, uh, giving support for trainings, uh, yeah, um, helping with the capacity development of the people. Um, so uh, looking only at costs, I think, is a little bit short-sighted. Uh, and renewables can deliver a lot of local jobs, not only offshore wind, but uh, PV or onshore wind uh, or biomass or whatever it may be. Um, uh, which will create many more jobs as if we would uh, try to do that with, uh, with oil and gas, what I also said in the previous session. Okay. Thank you. And, and so by extension, Andy, what, what do you see as being the biggest policy drivers in the markets that you talked about in Asia, and Taiwan and, and India? It, is it 
power on the grid? Is it carbon reduction or is it how much of an emphasis is there on local jobs creation and supply chain? It uh, depends on the market. So for uh, Taiwan, they're looking specifically at uh, short term to look for partnerships to increase the knowledge base. And then long term, they want to make it more and more drive towards their local content. So they want to develop a supply chain to become experts to help being a hub for further development in Southeast Asia. Yeah. Uh, in India, it's about getting power on the grid as much as possible. They, they have a lot of, they, they, they say that 95% of the, of the country is electrified. It's not really, I mean, they define sometimes electrification as having one light on in a village. There's a lot of areas that don't have the light. There's a lot of areas that don't have power. They need a lot of power to keep going with the development. And offshore wind is a, is a key element of that. Currently, the Indian government is a right of center government, which is all about uh, ensuring that uh, its, its mantra is India first. And it's trying to make sure that India content is as prevalent as possible within that. Uh, how that translates to offshore wind is something that I don't think has necessarily been driven through thoroughly in policy yet. Question from floor. Anybody inspired? Up at the back there, thank you. If you could state your name and affiliation, that would be useful, thanks. Hi, uh, I'm Narasimhan from Atkins. Uh, this goes into Andy again. Um, I know uh, for the offshore wind development in India, mm. there's a consortium of four wind, probably, in, uh, which are looking at some due diligence and things, policy frameworks. Do you have any few words to describe where they are? Are they about to conclude the studies uh, for wind leading into realization of a uh, couple of sites in Tamil Nadu and Gujarat? It's, uh, so for those of you who don't know, four wind is a, is a is a European initiative that's led by GWEC. Uh, they are looking to uh, essentially, as, as you've just intimated, put together policy. What's the issue has always been with some of the programs is that India are trying to develop policy but also have studies that are trying to inform policy working at exactly the same time. At this, in parallel, they have other companies trying to drive forward developments. It's unclear how four wind will influence policy. I think that's probably the best way to put it. Uh, they certainly have put out some information on cost of energy models. I don't think that it's that well received by some companies. It's well received by inward investors, European companies looking to get into India and understand. Uh, Indian developers are looking at different ways of trying to understand their cost model by using as much, as we say, local knowledge and know-how as possible. Uh, in terms of when they're going to report, uh, I know that they've just, one of their components was wind measurement and they've just started that wind measurement component in Gujarat. Uh, they are taking, uh, although they are I think using some of the data from a Rameshwaram mast down in uh, the Palk Strait, so they have some information to, to base some of their studies on. Uh, but hopefully they'll be reporting in the next year and I think that may be holding up partially the final ratification <coughs> of the offshore wind plots. Okay, thank you. I, I, I got a question. That's, that's okay. I, I think an, an interesting aspect of what you were talking about with regards to mass, as I briefly mentioned earlier, the, the, the impact of growth in offshore turbines, their weights and the restrictions that that puts on the the vessel market and, and by inference of that, the requirement, the pressure it puts on the vessel market to continue to grow and create new vessels, get bigger and get larger. Um, in, I assume perhaps you've had discussions with, with the turbine manufacturers. To what extent are they looking to manage mass of, of their units or do they see that the the big driver of, of size overrules that. Uh, thank, you. thank you for your question. First of all, I've not had a lot of interaction with manufacturers 
but from the ETI point of view, looking at the TLP platform and the supply chain and what's available, it is clear in the supply chain that they have to, almost like we were saying that in the last session, they have to move with the innovation. Mm. And we've seen that in the vessels as well. We've seen that from the CVTs to more advanced vessels. So in a way, I think that has been driven already. That's, we kind of see that already. That the supply chain does... Adapts to, yeah. to the change. However, the reason for this work is because the, the more complex the, your, your turbine or the more complex the structure and the design, so is the vessel to, to catch up with. We've seen that with the new foundations as well, when a jacket needs to be installed or you talked about the, uh, the bucket structure type. So I don't have an answer, a definitive answer as to what they are doing with the mass and what is the tipping point. However, to date, they are moving with the technology yeah. and they are trying to either double the vessels that is needed mm. or increasing the installation time, which is another problem with O&M. Yeah. So along with the design, so is the O&M that needs to almost work together to, to make it work. Okay, no, that's interesting. I think, it's, it's a, I think it's a topic that's starting to come to the fore is the, the risk of the vessel market. And I don't know if there's anybody representing the vessel market in the audience of interest in you. Uh, being concerned about how quickly their equipment might become obsolete because of the very rapid turbine size and mass and therefore them starting to face that risk. And so what we gain, at least some of what we might gain in larger turbines we may lose because the vessel market perhaps very justifiably decides that its risk of obsolescence has to be covered. Um, so it's a good problem to have, I guess. But and it's not only the vessels, you also, when you think about the trucks that need to move them, when we had to, the blade dynamics being delivered from the US, you still have to also think about those trucks that mm. you need to find, although the long blade was a modular uh, type of blade, so you had the option to have smaller parts, but you also have the whole transport fleet yeah. that has to adjust to that. So is the, even the hull, the, the, the port itself and where you're actually designing and manufacturing those. So it's a problem for, it's not a problem, but it's a challenge for more than one yes, yeah, yes. element, yeah. yeah. And of course the money, the capex being the major driver. Sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. No more questions from, from out there. Okay. Well, thank you all very much for your attention at this time of day. Um, I think it's been a very interesting session. Thank you to uh, to the speakers and if I could ask you just for one last time to thank them in the traditional way.